Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, uh, this is a joint book with Scott Shetty. So I'm going to start with uh, telling you what a hive is. Uh, so these are introduced by Knudsen and Tao uh, in order to prove something called the saturation conjecture that I'll briefly mention later. But a hive uh, is a triangular array of this sort. Uh, the boundary conditions are given once you're given three partitions. Uh, the partitions need to satisfy the condition that the sum of the parts in the first plus the sum of the parts in the second is equal to the sum of the parts in the third. So here, for example, what to do is you start with zero, and I'm going to tell you how to interpret lambda as a boundary condition here. You add 40, so you get 40. You add 30, you get 70. You add 20, you get 90. And you add 10, and you get 100. That's how lambda transfers onto the boundary here. Then you transfer mu onto the boundary here, which is, which is again, you add 40 for the first entry here. You add 30, add 20, and add 10, and you get here. Now, in order to put new on the hive, you put 65 here, add 55, add 45, add 35. And this picture is going to be consistent only if the sum of the entries of new is equal to sum of the entries of lambda plus the sum of the entries of new, because that's how you go from here to here, and then from here to here. So this is how the boundary values work. Uh, a hive is a filling of the interior or the lattice points in the interior with either uh, integer integers as was the original application of Nutsenta, or in our case, mostly it's going to be real numbers with the property that for every such rhombus, the sum of the entries on the shorter diagonal, like 90 plus 140 has to be greater or equal to the sum of the entries on the longer diagonal. So here 100 plus 125 is 225, which is therefore equal to uh, uh, 230 which is the sum of these two. So this, this condition has to be true for every rhombus, not just these vertical rhombi, but this rhombus, this rhombus, and so on. So if this is the case, then we say that this is a hive. So we'll be, we'll be uh, needing to talk about the discrete Hessian. Could you go back to that? I want to make sure I understand the, uh, the, the conditions. Yeah. So for each rhombus, uh, why? Okay, and then apart from that, you put some weights on. Just, that's the constraint you have. That's the constraint. Yeah, that's the only constraint. That's the, only constraint. the constraint is if you take the piecewise linear function with those boundary values in each triangle, then it's con it's a concave surface. Yeah, it's a concave surface. Oh, so, okay. so you can turn this into a surface over the entire triangle yeah. by. Yeah, taking piecewise linear extensions to these triangles, and then you will get a concave surface. And this is an if and only if condition. Yeah. So uh, we'll uh, talk about the discrete Hessian uh, in the coming slides. But uh, what we mean by the discrete Hessian is a map from the lozenges or the uh, unit rhombi to the reals. Which which take a take the take the unit rhombi to the value b plus b minus a minus c. So as we noted, this was a, this is going to be a concave surface. So we expect the Hessian to be non-positive, and b plus d minus a minus c will indeed be non-positive. So this behaves consistent with our idea of what a Hessian should do on a on a concave surface. So this, this discrete Hessian would be a map from the elementary rhombi to the reals once you've given a hive. So this is uh, this, the setting in which it was introduced in representation theory. Uh, 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 so uh, if you have these three partitions, then lambda, mu, and nu, then uh, uh, these integer boundary conditions get fixed. And uh, this is uh, the number of integer hives with the given boundary conditions, lambda, mu, and nu. It's called a little bit Richardson coefficient. coefficient. It counts the multiplicity with which the irreducible representation V nu of GLNC appears when you take the tensor product of V lambda tensor V nu. So these are irreducible representations of GLNC. They get parameterized by partitions. So it's it, these are called Klebsch coordinate coefficients in other settings. But for the GLNC group, they are called they have a special name. They are called little Richardson coefficients. Uh, and uh, this picture counts the C lambda mu nu, the number of integer hives is exactly C lambda mu nu. So this is the setting in which these hives were introduced. And uh, they were introduced, uh, oh, 
So, so no, this is not appearing. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. <coughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, so, so the saturation conjecture state states that if C lambda mu nu is greater than zero k k k for some uh, positive k, then C lambda mu nu is uh, uh, is greater than zero. So it's it's a property of these polytopes defined by these linear inequalities. If uh, if some dilation of that polytope contains an integer point, then the original polytope contains an integer point as well. So, uh, so our, our interest is more along the lines of statistical physics. Uh, so, uh, these are these hives can be thought of as uh, uh, height functions for random hexagonal tilings of this sort. So, in the uh, in the previous picture. Uh, if you have this uh, piecewise linear function, you can ask what is the gradient at this uh, on this phase. It's going to be some vector in R two. So what we do is we uh, take that vector in R two and plot it on the plane. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Can you go back with this uh, with the uh, tau? Yeah. So, so how do I get the C mu, uh, C lambda mu? It's the number of ways of filling the interior in a way that satisfy all the rhombus inequalities. That's what C lambda mu nu is. Lambda mu nu tell you how to write the boundary values. And it's just a number of ways you can compatibly yes. do this. Yes. So that's a huge number, really, right? Yes. That's, that's a huge degeneracy. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, so the way to get one of these pictures from the uh, 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 hive is that you take the gradient of one of these triangles and that is where you plot this vertex. So these vertices locations in the plane correspond to the gradients of those triangles when you take the concave function. And the reason why this line is vertical is that the, the, the gap between this triangle and this triangle is this line, and that is horizontal. So when you take the difference of the gradients of these two, uh, that is zero on this line. And so if you take the, uh, uh, if you look, therefore the, the difference of the gradients has to be vertical for this to hold. Uh, and uh, so, so those, those uh, high, height functions of these tilings can be viewed as, can be thought of as hives. And I've already told you, given a hive, how to get this hexagonal tiling. So these are dual pictures: this the honeycombs and the uh, and the hives. But there is another connection to square triangle tilings. Uh, so suppose you are given a honeycomb, which is it's the integer honeycomb. So the side lengths are all integers. Then what you can do is you can fill them with little squares in this fashion, and then you get this filled up honeycomb, or sort of the lines are actually little uh, unions of squares. And uh, you can fill up these pieces in between in a unique way using equilateral triangles. So in this way, this honeycomb now corresponds to a square triangle tiling of a certain domain. And let, let me now tell you what is the connection with the, the sort of the traditional way of writing a little bit coefficient using a let's so called the number of little bit of skew tableau. So what you're going to do is now the little division coefficient is also equal to the number of skew tableau with the following property. You, you, you fix the content, number of ones, number of twos, number of threes, number of fours in this, and you write all the rows as monotonically increasing, all the columns as strictly decreasing. And there's one additional LR constraint, which is that when you read this from right to left, uh, uh, bottom to top, the number of ones encountered at any time is greater or equal to the number of twos encountered at any time is greater or equal to the number of threes encountered and so on. And so once you have a tableau like this, uh, there's a way of producing a, a, a honeycomb like this. So what is done is these ones directly get placed here. The number of twos here, which is three, get placed here. 
So the threes, the two threes here get placed here, the two fours here get placed here. And then there are some more ones. So these two ones get placed here. These two uh, twos get placed here. This single three gets placed here. And uh, uh, these two ones get placed here. These two twos get placed here. And these two ones get placed here. So they're all equivalent. These LR, the LRQ tableau, the honeycomb picture, the, the hive picture, and even the square triangle tiling picture. So the, 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 how, how do you get the boundary values for the square triangle tiling? So this yellow part has been has to be put exactly here. This green thing has to be put exactly here. And this multicolored boundary that you see here is obtained by putting as many ones as you have in this picture in the bottom row, the number of twos as you have in this picture in the next row, number of threes in the next row, and number of fours in the top row. Okay, so this, these are all equivalent. So this, um... This construction, one was who, who discovered this? So this is, I believe, due to Terence Tao. This this map. Tao, Tao alone or Nixon and Tao? Uh, so I read somewhere that this is, uh, yeah, it's 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 a work of Nixon and Tao, but somebody quotes it as uh, Tao's proof by picture. Tao's proof by picture, and and before it, who first came up with this? Just as this is all in the world. This, so this is these these pictures or so these objects. I think are. In the paper by Kevin Purbu, but uh, um, um, uh, this, these puzzles are due to Nutsen and Tao. So these pictures, <laughs> these are deformations of these pictures, or rather, this is a deformation of this picture into a square triangle tiling because this has got wrong by. And how about this tableau description of the? So this is very old. I think this is due to uh, Littleton Richardson. Okay, so this is all the way back. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so this is, these are height functions in a different context. Uh, here we have a sawtooth domain, a, a, a trapezoidal domain, and we have a, a rhombi of three different shapes. And as you see, when we put together all these rhombi, which are green, orange, or red, you get a kind of surface, uh, which you see. And so this is the height, height function that we identify with this uh, tiling. And instead of studying the statistical properties of tiling, one can study the statistical properties of this height function. Um, and now I'll come to the like the main topic of our talk, which is the connection of these high polytopes with random matrices. So the volume, not only is the number of integer points in these polytopes important in little Richardson coefficients, but the volume of these polytopes has a close connection to the random matrix uh, horn problem, which is what is the spectrum of the sum of two matrices with, uh, when, with given spectra. Okay, so, so if you want to know what is, what is the probability that when I take two random Hermitian uh, uh, matrices with given spectra, that I add up and get an, a particular spectrum that is equal to the volume of this high polytope, which is cut out by these rhombus constraints with some uh, known multiplicative factors involving random on determinants as a small correction. Okay, so and this was uh, this was also due to the work of Knudsen and Tau. Actually, you, you, when you have these two matrices, you have two matrices of given spectrum, and then you swing one of them by a unitary. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The random and independent random yeah. 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 Okay, so I'm sorry, some of these things aren't coming, but I'll try to make up for it. So uh, uh, these uh, these minor processes are obtained uh, uh, when you take a, a particular Hermitian matrix X and you uh, conjugate it with a, a random unitary U, U, and then you look at the uh, you look at the principal minors and look at the eigenvalues. When you look at that, you get a, a picture like this, and it turns out, which is known through work of Barishnikov, that these, these pictures are uniform from the Lebesgue measure. So this becomes fixed because the spectrum of X is fixed. But then when you conjugate it randomly and you look at the spectra of the, of the principal minors, you get an interlacing sequence. So this will be less or equal to this. This will be greater or equal to this, and so on for every element. And that cuts, cuts out a polytope called the Gelfand Sutton polytope. So when you take a random matrix like this and do, do, do this thing, you get um, random points from the Gelfand Sutton poly, poly, polytope from the uh, Lebesgue measure. 
normalized. Sorry, I, I, I want to make sure I, I can go back to the previous slide with uh, with Amanda Matrix. I want to make sure I understood the statement. So I take two, I take, I fix lambda and mu. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and then. Yeah, you fix lambda and mu. So yeah. the, the spectrum of x is lambda, the spectrum of y is mu. And you consider u x u star plus v y v star, where u v are uh, independent, um, and uh, from the hard measure on the unitary group. So that's just the volume of that polytope you were describing, but you're. Uh, yeah. So so no no no. So, so then. Uh, where, where is it? Where oh, uh, We're going to look at the spectrum of this. So this has a certain measure. Yeah. And that measure can be read off using the volumes of these polytopes. Okay. And it, it, it's also true that the volumes of these gelfand settling polytopes is the Vandermond determinant corresponding to these entries. Uh, yeah, so 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 this is, I guess, the the uh, the uh, the central picture that I want to explain properly. So uh, suppose I'm given uh, two matrices with spectrum fifteen five minus five minus fifteen, and another matrix with the same spectrum fifteen five minus five minus fifteen. I'm going to conjugate them randomly with U and B hard random and independent. Take the spectrum. And ask, can I read off the spectrum somehow? And, it, and the answer to that is yes, due to the work of Knudsen and Tao. What you do is, you, 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 I told you how to write these two boundary conditions using the spectrum of lambda and the spectrum of mu. You put, put zero on this bottom side and let this be free. Now on this, above this pink diagonal, the, uh, uh, we, have, we have a hive. So all the rhombus inequalities need to be satisfied. So for example, so yeah, so this is this is a distorted hive. I've turned the equilateral triangle into a right triangle just to put it in a square. Below this, this is not actually a hive. It is a gel fan settling pattern that has been that has been uh, slightly uh, you know uh, rewritten to look like a hive. But actually, it's not a hive. For example, for this square, you don't have the hive inequalities. What this is is it's a gel fan settling pattern. Fifteen five minus five minus fifteen. 10, 5, minus 5, 7, 0, 0 on the edges. And then we uh, we write, get a, a function on the vertices by simply starting from 0 and adding the sums cumulatively as we go from uh, left bottom to right top. So here we get a 10 because from 0 you add 10, then you add 5, you get 15, you add minus 5, you get 10, and so on. So this I'm going to call a near hive just for notation purposes. But so this is actually a, a hive coupled with a near hive, what you have to do is you have to, you get this from the spectrum of X, you get this from the spectrum of Y, then you pick a random point in this polytope where the constraints above the pink diagonal involve all the rhombi, the constraints below the pink diagonal involve all the rhombi, all the spallograms that are not squares. For squares, you don't require the rhombus inequality to hold. So it's, so this is the picture. And if you do this, then the, <laughs> Then what you read off on the pink diagonal, the, the, the slopes here, has exactly the same distribution as the spectrum of Z when you do this. Yeah. Is the spectrum the spectrum would not be integer usually generically, right? Yeah, yeah, but this is just a typical this is just a picture I do. So what we have to do is you what is fixed is the top row, the left left column here, and the bottom row, and then you have to fix the fill the corresponding solid polytope with a random real point and you take the, and then once you get the random real point it will you can read off what you see on the pink diagonal reminds there are no boundary conditions on the right boundary no mm -hmm. and that that has exactly the same distribution as the spectrum of z uh, written monotonically decreasing fashion so this is also, this also follows from the work of Nutsir and Tao so this this stuff below the pink diagonal is actually just a uh, uh, has a volume of a Vandermond determinant 
because these delta and certain patterns have that volume and it's there just to just as that multiplicative correction term that was there in that earlier slide it said that it's not the exactly the high volumes that give the probabilities it's the high volumes with a with a multiplicative correction which is this vandermont determinant and this vandermont determinant has exactly the same volume as the volume of the gelfand settling pattern so that's why this is there this is there for that reason then there are integers here just for purposes of demonstration yes yes but in, in the real numbers of those as real numbers yes yes Oh, sorry. Okay, so I'll skip this. Okay, so uh, so so we are going to we are interested in large deviation principles, uh, where you uh, uh, where we are going to have a fixed function on this right side, a fixed function on this side, which is which is strongly concave and. Uh, 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 strongly concave as Lipschitz is Lipschitz and has zero on the endpoints. So you have two functions, one here and one here. And now we are going to let the mesh tend to zero and ask what the, what is the distribution that you see on the pink diagonal look like in a large deviation sense as n tends to infinity. Okay, so you have a family of measures given by these. Uh, uh, random points in these polytopes that the dimension of these polytopes is n squared and n is tending to infinity, but we are only looking at what happened in the pink diagonal. So that's uh, a push forward of this measure onto some smaller thing. And uh, we are interested in large deviation principles for the spectrum of the sum of these two matrices. This new n is getting uh, transformed into a function in L infinity zero one. So this is the pink diagonal, the zero one. And we're looking at it, this in the L infinity zero one topology. And we want to get a large deviation principle. So that's the topic of the talk. So, uh, uh, so lambda mu are strongly decreasing. This is uh, uh, in zero one integrate to zero. This lambda N of I is the slope of the ith piece mu n of i is the slope of the i piece in the horizontal thing which encodes mu. Sigma is going to be our surface tension, which we will, uh, which will, will be interpreted in terms of the volumes of some polytopes, which I'll discuss later. V lambda is a continuous analog of the Vandermond determinant. And this is the rate function that we get. So it is not explicit in the sense that we don't have a closed form expression for sigma, but we, we can show that it exists and, and that this rate function in terms of this sigma uh, will be our will will underlie our large deviation principle. So this is a logarithm of something that in, in terms of lambda mu nu and this is a constant. Plus this is somehow the best hive that you can choose with the boundary values lambda mu and nu in the sense of having maximum entropy or minimum rate function. So the minimum uh, the infimum overall hives of the of the surface integral of the surface tension. So the minimum surface tension hive is what determines the rate function for this question. Can I have any question? So you, you say you don't know what, what, what sigma is? or We don't have a closed form for sigma. Yeah. So sigma is just related to f. It's yes, and I, but I, I, I tell you a limiting construction for sigma. And it's you a, know some properties? Of yes, sigma. we know some properties. Yeah, so this is our main theorem. Let a and b n squared by two. For every Borel measurable e containing L infinity zero one, the negative infimum over the interior of e of i gamma is less or equal to the limits as n tends to infinity of a n inverse log uh, p n of e, which is less or equal to lim sup n tends to infinity a n inverse log p n of e, which is less or equal to negative infimum as gamma belongs to the closure of e of i gamma. This is the usual form of a large deviation principle. So now I'll describe to you how we get sigma. So sigma is obtained by looking at uh, hives that are parabolic in the large with a given uh, Hessian. Uh, so this is uh, going to be an average Hessian. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to look at an infinite, uh, infinite hive, which has got a periodic Hessian over with a period that is given by this fundamental domain. It's a la very large fundamental domain of size N. And, but the average is fixed to be uh, S0, S1, S2 on the different rhombi. 
So S0 is the is the average Hessian, uh, negative of the average Hessian in one of these rhombi. S2 is the negative of the average Hessian in, in a second type of rhombi. And S2, S3, well, yeah, S2 is on the, S1 is on the third. Uh, okay, so, uh, so this is not very convenient as of now. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this random construction and we're going to add a fixed convex parabolic uh, uh, function to it, which has exactly this discrete Hessian, S0, S1, S2. In the process, what was once a random concave function on the plane has now become a random semi-concave function on the plane. But now it's not just got a periodic Hessian, it's got a period, it's, it's periodic in value because we have taken away the, the second derivative on average. So, and then we'll also add a constant to it to make it mean zero. So what we'll now look at is on a torus, we we'll look at mean zero semi-concave functions whose Hessians are bounded above by S0, S1, or S2, depending on the orientation of the rhombus. So now uh, the, the sigma is actually in terms of the volume of this polytope. I just described a polytope, which is kind of a periodic hype setting. It's, uh, the, the sigma is in terms of the volume of PN of S. So let me, so in order for this to work, we need to, uh, we need to make the limit as n tends to infinity pn of s to the one by n squared minus one have a limit. And this is what I'll outline the steps of now. Uh, so, uh, so first of all, we need a good lower bound on the volume of this, this pn of s. I'm going to take two equal to s0, less or equal to s1, less or equal to s2. This is just a matter of scaling and orientation. Once we have that, uh, the, the, the set of all points which uh, which have entries in minus half to half so this is a cube and 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 which have zero mean that is actually contained in pn of s one can just check that all the rhombus inequalities will get satisfied and it is known that a section of a cube has a volume that is at least one therefore pn of s is greater or equal to one this is through a result of j waller So uh, uh, the marginals of log concave densities are log concave as a, as a consequence of the precopa lindler inequality. And using differential entropy, uh, we show that uh, the limb soup of Pn of s to the 1 by n squared minus 1 is less or equal to 2e. Uh, so this is uh, basically what one does is one looks at the slacks of one of these, let's say, the squares. So, so these squares are bounded above by two, let's say, in their uh, in their discrete Hessian. They are not bounded below. But if you have any distribution, probability distribution, which is bounded above by two and has no bound below, it's different and, and is mean zero, which is the case here, the differential entropy can be bounded above in this fashion. So that gives you a bound on the upper bound on the differential entropy. A better bound for this can be obtained using a comparison to the Boutelier bead model, but uh, that will not be necessary for us. So we thus have a both lower bound on the limb of Pn of s to the 1 by n squared minus 1 and the upper bound on the limb soup of Pn of s to the 1 by n squared minus 1. Uh, so then uh, uh, let, let C be less than n2, less than n3. Then uh, I'm sorry, this, this has not come properly through. But, uh, but basically, uh, uh, the, this, as n goes, as n tends to infinity, uh, so uh, Pn of s, the volume of Pn of s to the one by n squared minus one uh, is uh, is approximately monotonically increasing. It's not exactly monotonically increasing, but but we can show it's approximately monotonically increasing. And since we have both upper and lower bounds, uh, that's good enough to prove that the limit exists. So that's the upshot of this. And and we get some rates as well about how quickly this uh, this this converges to the limit. 
So, so now let me tell you a little bit about how the upper bound and the lower bound in the large deviations principle come about. Uh, so let, let K and L be a uh, compact convex subsets of Rm, where M is greater or equal to one. Uh, the Brun-Minkowski inequality states that the, the, the Minkowski sum of K plus L, which is the set of all vectors, which can be expressed as sum of two vectors, the first vector in uh, K and the second vector in L, uh, to the one by m is greater or equal to k to the one by m plus l to the one by m in volume. <coughs> so this Minkowski sum can also be thought of as you have this green uh, uh, convex set here. You take it and you translate it in all possible ways using vectors in the blue polytope. So this uh, traces out a certain convex set, and that is the Minkowski sum of k and l. And uh, for every n, uh, this Pn of s to the 1 by n squared minus 1 is a concave function of s through uh, the brun minkowski inequality. What happens is, suppose you have Pn of s and Pn of s prime, and you look at Pn of s plus s prime by 2, then Pn of s plus s prime by 2 contains the Minkowski average of Pn of s and Pn of s prime. And this is just by one can do, one can check the, that the, all the inequalities are satisfied. So, so this so, so we get that fn of s is a concave function, and hence we get that f of s, which is the pointwise limit, is also, also a concave function. So, so now I'll come to so the, so the one of the main ideas in proving these upper and lower bounds for the large deviation principle. Um, so what so suppose you want to prove an upper bound. Now what happens is uh, you're, you're going to be looking at random hives. Some of these boundaries are much more likely. If you, we're going to restrict the hive to these uh, boundaries of these uh, dyadic cubes. There are actually four or five layer boundaries. Uh, and then uh, we're going to ask, well, uh, if I knew that the values on the, where, the, where so and so on these uh, four layer or five layer boundaries, what is the measure of all, all points that extend this to the interior of the hive? And the answer to that is it's actually the product of the volumes of the polytopes corresponding to this piece, 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 and this piece. And the reason is that these, uh, these four or five layer boundaries are enough to completely isolate these pieces from each other because none of the rhombus constraints can straddle from one interior of one of these uh, boxes to the interior of the other. And as a result, the volume, once you condition on these bands, is just a product. So we're going to use this uh, in both the upper and lower bound. So here is the upper bound. Uh, for the upper bound, uh, we note that uh, 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 so, so suppose I have this, this fixed, the boundary fixed. Now it turns out that if I have a hive uh, that, that fills this inside with all the rhombus constraints, the average Hessian is entirely determined because I have these double layer boundaries. So for example, if I sum up all the slacks corresponding to these constraints, rhombus constraints, the telescope, and the only things that matter are this, 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 these two, these two, these two, and this one, these two, these two, these two, and these two, and this one, because uh, all the others just cancel out. So, so the average average Hessian can be read off using the boundary values by a kind of Green's theorem, and this is true for each of each each type of uh, e this is true for each type of uh, constraint. So now uh, we can ask, okay, what is the ma maximum possible entropy given these constraints, and that by the brun minkowski theorem uh, becomes uh, the uh, that it becomes the parabolic shape basically so the boundary values that correspond to the maximum entropy once you fix the average hessians is the one that would correspond to a paraboloid that's the that's the most uh, efficient or most uh, the, the one that maximizes the volume of the polytope under these constraints so so this gives us a inequality in terms of p and one of s, so it's not in exactly p and one of s because of these fixed boundaries, but actually it turns out that when you, uh, I'll come to this a little later, but when you condition on the right values for these paraboloids, which namely are their means, you actually don't reduce the entropy much. But but 
actually you will reduce the entropy so this statement will be correct it's still a lesser equal to this is going to be slightly bigger than what we get yeah, so this is uh, reiterating that point and uh, uh, and now, so now what you get here is in terms of some sort of average here because we've we've done this averaging of the of the uh, slacks and what we wanted was something like this but this 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 lemma can be proved using sub submartingale convergence of a particular submartingale uh, uh, and this something like this in a slightly stronger form is needed to translate into the upper bound but i won't talk about the upper bound in greater detail I'll now go to the lower bound so so in the lower bound what happens is uh, you need to show that suppose uh, this the set e in l, l infinity 0 1 contains a, a particular uh, uh, nice hive then corresponding to that nice continuum hive you can actually generate a lot of a lot of entropy that's what needs to be shown so what we do is we take these nice hives since since we are it's this 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 point is not only in e it's in the interior of e you can convolve it with a small bump function at a very small length scale and get a uh, a C2 <laughs> function, which has slightly different boundary conditions, but very close boundary condition, but it's now C2. And for C2 things, because uh, the second derivative is continuous, you can localize closely enough so that you can essentially assume that these are parabolic locally. And when they're parabolic by the same argument that I mentioned just now, this Fradelli's theorem says that the value of a log concave density at its mean is at least e to the minus n times the density at any other point, n being the number of frozen nodes, which is much smaller than n squared, which is the total number of nodes. And this allows us to, uh, this allows us to freeze these vertices uh, to, to, with a little bit of fuzz because we're talking about differential entropy, but in such a way that you don't actually reduce the entropy in, in terms of uh, the bulk amount. And uh, so, so you we basically uh, you 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 can uh, you can fit these uh, little pieces, quadratic pieces, and, and obtain a nice hive after translation, after translating these pieces by a little bit. So you get a nice hive, which is C two, and it doesn't quite meet the boundary conditions. But by the same result of Knudsen and Tao, which relates the uh, the matrix story with the hives, you can actually uh, make a correction using. So by saying that we'll add two hives with a small norms given by maximum deviation in terms of high boundary. And this results in a matrix with a small Kaifan norm. Kaifan norm is simply the sum, I mean, I mean the max over all sequences of uh, sums of uh, eigenvalues in our case from one to I. So you, the, the, the Kaifan norm is uh, uh, for fixed I, it's the sum of the top K eigenvalues as far as we are concerned singular values actually, but we, we can work with eigenvalues. Uh, and uh, if you take the max over all i, that is the norm we care about. It's the deviation that we see in the boundary of the hive. So this, this, this fact actually allows us to get better boundary conditions in the case where uh, you're only looking at L infinity zero one on a pink diagonal than when we're looking at hives as a whole. So now I'll talk about the large deviation principle for hives. Uh, for hives, uh, we uh, the, the 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 rate function is given in terms of this this uh, this integral. It is the negative log of this j by v lambda v nu. This is again the continuous analog of a Vandermonde determinant. So now we are talking about large deviations for these <laughs> surfaces uh, on the above the pink diagonal on the triangle T. Um, so, so because of this issue of uh, smoothing, we have to uh, satisfy ourselves with a lower bound that is in terms of hives that dominate in terms of the Hessian. The Hessian is actually a radon measure in, for in general here. Uh, that a C2 hive, uh, some C2 hive, and the measure that you get in the lower bound uh, is corresponds to this, that C2 hive. Okay, so this is the kind of lower bound we get for, uh, for hives. The upper bound was in terms of is in terms of C zero hives. It is it, you don't require to do the smoothing. It's so it's a better setting. Uh, uh, and 
In the case when lambda and mu are C1, so this is like a stronger condition, we can nonetheless get a large deviation principle. And the reason for this is that uh, when lambda and mu are C1, there's a way of uh, uh, getting these C2 hives with, with, with exactly the right boundary conditions if you have a good C0 hive with large entropy. So you can, you can perturb this C0 hive, which has a good entropy, and get a, uh, get a C2 hive if the boundary conditions are C2. So lambda and mu C1 correspond to boundary conditions that are C2 with exactly the, the right boundary conditions. And this is, uh, I'll sketch how this is done. Uh, so this is the large deviation principle. It says the, says, says the same thing. So uh, uh, you take a, you take the C0 hive and you, you it's, it's, it's on this triangle. The C0 hive is on this triangle. So what you first do is you take it and you shift the triangle to this triangle and, and write the C0 hive on this. Then what you do is you add a linear function to this so that the gradient at this point is zero. Then what you do is you, you add these constants on this green line. So it's constant on this green line. You fill up this portion. This portion is filled with zero everywhere. You can assume that the value and the gradient is zero here, in which case you fill this entire square with zeros. And these are fixed, fixed, filled, filled as level sets. So they are all constant. So this is some intermediate level hive. Now what you do is, so this has not got the right boundary conditions yet because uh, this has got shifted. And so what should have been here has, has, has come here and so on. But uh, with, you have to make a slight correction beforehand. The fact that C2 boundary conditions allows you to, after you do the, the convolution with a small bump function, it allows you to correct the boundary conditions by addition of a hive. This is not in general possible, but when the boundary conditions are C2, it is possible. So you can get a C2 function with a very similar rate function. And when I similarly give an argument for the uh, um, fan settling pattern here, but that can be done. And uh, this gives us a large deviation principle for the uh, for this uh, for this uh, hives if they have C2 boundary condition. So uh, uh, I'll now sketch some open problems. So one open problem is, can we have a large deviation principle for these with, uh, with just uh, uh, concave Lipschitz boundaries? So lambda is concave and, uh, I mean, lambda is, the integral of lambda is concave and Lipschitz. And so, of, so with mu, we don't have the C1 condition. Can you still get a large deviation principle? And uh, ultimately, uh, we would like to have a closed form expression for f of s or equivalently sigma of s using which you would like to write a PDE for the scaling limit of a random augmented hive with given boundary conditions along the lines of cohen kenyon prop, a variation principle for domino tilings. Such a result will shed light on tilings, random matrices, and asymptotic representation theory. So some, uh, I've just mentioned one fact that, so uh, there is a degeneration of sigma when you let s2 tend to infinity. And there the closed form is known through the work of uh, uh, actually Samuel Johnston, but also related work of Sun, Schlack, Tenko, and Tao, and Van Rusan. And, and then we have such a uh, expression. So uh, thank you. Any questions? So if you and V instead are not from the unitary group, let's say the orthogonal group, is it also known there's connections to representation theory? Uh, I think uh, less is known, but I don't know what, what is known. I mean, uh, so th there are hive-like uh, gadgets for these other groups, but I think they're less, uh, they're more complicated. I guess like I feel some of these arguments is quite similar to what I've seen in like say tinings, right? Like you split into boxes, but here is the main thing is that you cannot have the closed form for the tension yeah. term, right? But in a tiny you do have that. Yeah. So that there you can I see. But you know it's convergence, you have this, but yeah. just like you don't know what the yes. <clears throat> Uh, 
Okay, well, let's think.